antiquity consisted largely of theocratically governed states. Behind every ruler was a prophet. We know from the Old Testament, the books of the major and minor prophets, we realize that these esteemed personages were able to stand up in front of the ruler and tell him he was wrong and live through it. There was something about the prophet of old that was sacred in itself. One of the important values involved was the common respect of the governed and the governing for the revelation of the deities of their nations. The Greeks, the Romans, the Persians, the Egyptians, all the Semite peoples were units in which the most important binding factor was a common faith. <clears throat> this common faith sometimes was bounded uh, by racial differentiation. Sometimes it was merely a voluntary political allegiance. The most important factor involved was that in most of the ancient nations, uh, the people had one religion. There was very little um, creedalism or sectarianism, and such as there was, was controlled by a very simple code, which was held to be inviolate among all the different groups, cultural and racial. Whenever you travel and go into the precincts of a different faith, you accept it with courtesy and abide by it, and make no effort to disrupt it or condemn it. In other words, when you travel from one religious area to another, you leave behind the one you respected, and move into one you will respect. There was no problem, as we have it, of feeling it important or mandatory to downgrade somebody else's thinking. You were a visitor in another country. This made you a guest. You were treated properly by your host, and you treated your host with respect. This used to also be carried into private life. In old days, when a stranger of another religion asked for your, asked for your help or courtesy, you always gave it. There was never a refusal on the basis of creed or sect. You might not intend to obey the principles of the visitor's religion, but you will respect it and honor him for it. This was common practice among the American Indian tribes. Some of these tribes were comparatively small. Others were major nations. But in each of them, the visitor was accepted for his integrities, and there was never an argument over his deities. This uh, type of condition made it much easier for the older nations uh, to develop a moral structure suitable to their needs. Now, the Greeks also realized uh, that temporal strength had, a, had an effect upon spiritual integrities. Uh, one of the great Greek thinkers observed that laws were like the webs of spiders. They captured the small insects, but the greater ones broke through. The same was true of moral courtesies. The uh, leaders, particularly powerful and ambitious princes, might very well break the rules, the laws, and the covenants of their country in the advancement of personal ambitions. They were reproached immediately by their religious leaders. But it was often impossible, and even in those days, for religion to hold ambition in check. As a result, 
many leaders went out to their own ways of life and in almost every instance came to grief. This brought again to the sage a new example. He no longer spoke just of the laws of his tribe or the laws of his gods. He reminded the people many times what happened when they disobeyed these laws, and he was able to prove what occurred when ambitious princes went against the covenants of their peoples. This became a powerful argument in defense of religious principles. Among the first nations that worked with the problem of interreligious understanding was the Roman Empire. Rome extended its domains through many areas and subjugated a great variety of beliefs held by tribes, groups, and even nations. The Greeks, therefore, and the Romans were forced to come into factual relationship with religion. They had to decide for once and for all how they were going to handle a religious diversity. Cicero and Seneca and uh, Julian, Marcus Aurelius, all of these rulers were confronted with interreligious problems. The final answer seemed to be revealed in the Roman Forum, for in the ruins of the Forum today are the shrines and temples of several religions, side by side. Apparently there was no necessity for downgrading these different faiths. An interesting angle of this, however, was the fact that all of these religions had esoteric schools or teachings. And uh, very often the Roman was initiated into the various mysteries of several of the shrines and temples that stood in the Forum. He might be a follower of Mithras and still be a good Roman with great respect for Jupiter and Juno. He might be an Egyptian and he might be initiated into Greek rites or other divisions, Persian and uh, even Oriental. Therefore, in the days when human beings were thoughtful and began to realize the identity of belief, there was very little actual religious persecution unless some group failed to live its own faith. This could produce serious consequences. In the place of the prophets, the sibyls, and uh, the muses and these various deities, in the descent of moral tradition, uh, has been pretty well explored, and we have a fair picture of the facts of the matter. We know now that all of these nations had somewhere among them people who were strangely mystical that actually mysticism was behind practically every religion that arose in the world. Mysticism was an experienced doctrine. The individual had an internal experience of his own, and this experience converted him uh, to a concept of truths. If he was so converted, he might feel impelled to share it with others. The Jewish prophets, as we find them in the Old Testament, were for the most part isolated mystics. They lived in the deserts or in small communities or monastic groups. They depended for their instruction upon an internal enlightenment. Because it was a spiritual experience in themselves, attended by various psychic phenomena, particularly that of internal illumination, these prophets felt entitled to refer to themselves as messengers of God. The message they received came to them in their meditation, 
or in their devotions. Most of these prophets were unworldly persons. They made no pretense uh, to a physical uh, grandeur. They did not work for money. They did not expect fame. They were devout, devout persons dedicated to the revelation of inner certainties that had been bestowed upon them, they believed, by divine intercession. These prophets, going around among the people, very often came into conflict with prevailing customs. But they did not come into conflict with the basic religion of the country where they traveled. Uh, the Jewish prophets were in no way in conflict with the Mosaic Revelation. What they really were was rem reminding thoughts or think thinkers to bring back these peoples to the faith that they declared they possessed. So a prophet was often a reviver of beliefs. A similar type of revelation and, revil and revising took place all through the world. In China, Confucius restored the ancient faiths. Lao Tzu restored the ancient mystical tradition of the Far East. Buddha reformed Brahmanism. Muhammad attempted a reformation of both Christian and Jewish beliefs and doctrines. Zoroaster restored the faith of the ancient Persians. These teachers were restorers and revisers. They brought a more vital statement to their people. Most of them came when the people themselves had drifted away from their spiritual traditions. They came when there was too much commercialism, too much ambition, too little regard for integrities, and as virtue fails, then these prophets came forth. There is a line of this, of course, in the Hindu classics, in which the deity Vishnu is made to say, When virtue fails upon the earth, I come forth. So wherever the people fell away from principles, the old prophets came forth, and sometimes in anger, sometimes with very gentle persuasion, always reminding the people when they had drifted away from the covenants which brought them security and peace. And incidentally, in old times, there were very few records of these old prophets being badly treated. The people themselves knew the prophets were right. And while they might not be able to live the doctrine, they respected it in those who could. As time went on, of course, uh, the various religions became more or less competitive. An example of this will be found in Alexandria, where the Jewish, Christian, Egyptian, and Greek communities were all within the walls of the one city. But they were broken up into groups and had areas particularly set aside for their own beliefs. For a long time, under the Greek pharaohs, uh, these four different communities of thinkers got along very, very well. The wiser among them shared the common knowledge. There was very little misunderstanding or persecution. It was not until one or two of the groups became more dominantly determined to become uh, the prevailing faith that competition came in. And within two or three hundred years of the first dawn of competition, Alexandria was no longer a city of importance. Alexandria was destroyed by contention within itself. It was destroyed when those who believed in peace failed to practice it, when those who believed in brotherhood became enemies, and those who believed in the worship of one God divided that God and parceled out the divine principles in small packages. These difficulties... Uh, have always existed. Now it would seem that coming down out of the more remote periods of human religious history that we should have learned a lot. After all, we have buried a number of civilizations 
of which very little remains except a, a reminder in history. We have seen great powers rise and fall. We have seen proud rulers attempt to conquer the earth and finally come to what the Egyptians realized, that no man can control more earth than that which is his own tomb. This uh, realization uh, has great interest, and it should have had a lasting effect upon the life of the human being. We have behind us a terrific record of what happens when we do things badly. Now, we are not without our own prophets either, because every occasion where an, a crisis arises, someone comes forward with rather practical suggestions. We are not without leaders with vision, but we are followers who do not much, are not much interested in vision. The world has gradually broken itself into such small segments that we feel comparatively comfortable to injure those who belong to other segments, but will be rather careful to keep happiness with those of the same segment. segment. We are not able anymore to maintain the homogeneity of essential religious belief. And because of this failure, uh, today our problems are multiplying very rapidly. Now, we know, for instance, that in the classical periods from Plato down to the present time, most philosopher mystics were also rather adroit and rather comprehensive in their social and political thinking. We know also that nearly all of them gained a certain recognition in philosophy or in religion, but nearly all of them were unable to break through the political barrier. As far as politics that were concerned, these issues came too close to the ambitions of private citizens. The average citizen did not want equality. He did not want goods divided equally. He did not want to have only his own share. Practically every private citizen wanted more than his part of the common good. He wanted to dominate, he wanted to compete. He wanted to gradually gain ascendancy and with it temporal power. Most of the religions of the world have not been very basically concerned with temporal power, but nearly all of them ultimately became involved in this this quicksand. The original Christianity had no interest in temporal power. Uh, Christ stated that definitely that his kingdom was not of this world. But in the course of time, the physical institutions become more and more powerful, and the spiritual values are more or less ignored. So the prophets of old has, have left their predictions as in Isaiah, in Ezekiel, and others, or in the, the Apocalypse of John, have left certain uh, secret codes or secret beliefs, or have given to the world their vision of tomorrow, the inevitable result of things continuing as they are. If uh, Isaiah was writing today, he would very largely... Uh, proceed on the basis of our present policies. He would tell us simply and directly what would happen if we kept on doing the things we are doing now. Buddha would have done the same. Muhammad would have done the same. Each one would have brought to us the reminder that when we depart from integrities, we move inevitably into disaster. Now, most people in the quietude of their own thinking believe this, but so many ulterior situations arise that the average person finally comes to a compromise between what he ought to believe and what he does believe. Actually, the real textbook of government has yet to be written. It should be based fully upon human experience, 
It should set forth the inevitable relationships of cause and effect. It should point out that those who live by the sword perish by the sword. This can be proved beyond any question. This can be scientifically d demonstrated without doubt. But it does not, as yet, become part of the accepted traditions of leaderships and political administrations. There is every reason why we need to bring some of these facts into our educational system. And there are two ways of presenting the material. One is to point out lo logically and reasonably the consequences of breaking the basic rules of life. The other approach would be constructive and simple by simply stating that these rules are the things we should all accept, that they are the basis of our survival. All the way along the line, great nations have fallen. The Medes and the Persians went. Practically every country of antiquity died of its own corruptions. And these corruptions were not especially uh, different from the fallacies and shortcomings of today. We say, from looking back at the Roman Empire, that the Romans ate too much, that the Greeks drank too much, that private citizens gradually became more and more involved in luxury. When someone asked a Greek philosopher to curse someone else who was evil, he said, what a master is the worst curse of all? And the old philosopher replied, the worst curse is to say to a man, may your son live in luxury. <laughs> this is his destruction and his end. Now we know these things, so we get more luxurious every day. It does not occur to us that these things are true. Or perhaps we like to assume that which cannot rationally or logically be demonstrated, namely that each is an exception to the rules. We have a feeling that we are going to be able to accomplish the things we want to accomplish, regardless of whether they are right or wrong. We get back again also to the classical times, and we find that there was always a certain kind of division uh, which uh, had to be accepted. A division between those who had insight and those who lacked the insight. In the Greek, Roman, Egyptian, Persian, and Semitic empires, any young person who wanted to become a public benefactor could receive an appropriate education. If he decided in himself, in his teens or any other time, that he wanted to help the world. He was always encouraged to do so. And today, if a young person has this type of an attitude, he will be talked out of it, if possible. Because uh, uh, people will tell him, if you follow this way of your own choice, you will be poor and forgotten very quickly. But in the days of the, when philosophy was the ruler of life, these young people were honored by the fact that they wished to make a contribution. It immediately set them, set them aside as a superior person, as one who had dedications beyond the ordinary. And if the individual succeeded in attaining to the initiation into the great rites, and became truly a philosopher or an illuminated human being, a sage. He was honored by all who came in contact with him, and a king could not remain seated in his presence. Yet he may have been the son of a farmer. This is a different type of life. It is a life based very largely on a merit system. No one said you had to be a philosopher. No one said you had to live better than the others. But if you did, you were accredited rather than questioned and doubted. Of course, if you received these rites, you were then also the child of the temple. You were set aside in life, and this gave you great privileges, but also great responsibility. If an initiate of the mysteries 
committed an action that was against the principles of the faith. He was disgraced utterly. No matter how uh, much he had previously been admired, if he ceased to be admirable, this was held more against him than any other thing in life. He might make a mistake in his beliefs, this would be forgiven. But if he failed to live the integrities of his beliefs, these uh, shortcomings would not be forgotten. And what were the basics, the basic ideas that bound these people? Probably the most common and basic idea of all was the belief in a divine power at the source of life, a divine power that could not be corrupted or compromised by man, a divine power that had as its primary purpose the perfection of all that lives, a power which therefore would support all that contributed to progress and would punish all that de destroyed progress or interfered with its advancement. The uh, idea was that behind all human attitudes there was a code that was inflexible and inevitable, that this code could not be broken, and that it was present in all religions. And though variously worded, the code was always the same in principle. Therefore, only those who kept the rules could be kept by the rules. The second principle that would probably uh, become a dominant in the life of this type of person was unworldliness, that the individual must decide within himself where values were. And if these values were in the improvement of his own nature and in the service of his fellow men, then he kept the rules. If these values were to bring profit, physical profit to himself, if they were to increase his dignity, if they fulfilled his ambitions, his uh, egotisms, or his various forms of self-centeredness, then they were wrong. So the uh, prophet was always a simple person, not interested in any physical attachments which might later force him to compromise his principles. He might also be considered to be a, a champion of world brotherhood. He believed in peace. He believed in friendship between all that lived. He believed in honesty in relationships and practices. He believed in kindness and fidelity. All these, these beliefs were based upon the sacred revelations of his faith. They were based upon the teachings of the schools to which he belonged. And these same schools were the ones that had the great admiration of all the population. They were respected even if they could not be fully obeyed. The difference between the initiate and the non-initiate, therefore, was the fact that those who entered the temple made a commitment of themselves to a concept or a belief. They assumed responsibility for the control of their own conduct. Those who were not initiated were not faced with this decision, although many who were not in any way associated with mystical institutions chose the same path out of their own integrities. And so it came about that the, the past has given us a very mottled record of human progress. But at the back, behind all of these different con conflicts and confusions, there are these dim but powerful figures of the great teachers, those whom the world will never forget. They come in all nations. They have come in all times in history. But they have stood out for principles and have left behind them institutions of integrities, which if obeyed would preserve the honesty and the peace of the world. So we come down now through this procedure out of the dimness of the past, and we find that we have inherited uh, this magnificent vision. And I'm glad to be able to say that uh, 
In the last few years, a great many basic texts of these older beliefs are now available in paperback for us here. And the beliefs that 50 years ago no one was interested in, really, are now becoming of importance to many people. And new organizations and religious groups are arising everywhere for the purpose of trying to bring closer this relationship which is inevitable if we would survive. Now this also results in a combination of conditions which was more or less influenced by the Protestant Reformation. In the Protestant Reformation, Christianity was divided. And from this basic division, it's continued to subdivide until we have an excessive sectarianism. A sectarianism uh, which is constantly bringing us troubles as well as expressions of personal individual belief. Sectarianism uh, has resulted in a competitive religious institution that has no foundation in any one basic evaluation which is compatible with all the others. The sectarian groups, therefore, have a tendency to defend their sects. They want to perpetuate their own schools, churches, and beliefs, and in so doing do come into conflict with other groups. This conflict itself was one of the things that the prophets of old raised their voices against. Conflict on matters of religion is bound to be a disaster. It is a disaster to believe that the gods in the sky fought above the cities on the plains in ancient times, or that Minerva, uh, armor clad, fought in the heavens above the walls of Troy, that the uh, various religions and the deities uh, should become in conflict is a very sad and distinct mistake. Now, why can this happen? Why do we suddenly find ourselves in a world in which so much of our spiritual heritage is simply ignored, that we have no real reason uh, to feel a dependency upon anything of a spiritual nature. That does not mean that there are not devout persons. There are millions of them, and they are very sincere people, and they are trying their best. But too often they have asked for bread, and we have given them a stone. We have not recognized the importance of the good people becoming not necessarily better people, but gaining stronger reasons and incentives for the virtues which they possess. There is no reason why every believer in religion should not have a solid foundation in the principles of religion, entirely apart from all sectarian differences. The sectarian differences are unfortunate, but the individual can rise above them. And there is every inducement to in Christendom, all of these sects combine in the recognition of the New Testament and the ministry of Christ. With this in common, how can there be division? This is a question that has been brought up before religious councils for a long, long time. A faith that in substance is based upon one occurrence in the history of mankind is unable to unite itself in the fulfillment of the will and, and wisdom of their founder. This is the problem that we face. In this sense, Jesus was not only a great spiritual leader, but he was also a prophet. He was one that brought to the attention of the world the summary of the mistakes of the past and built upon the summation of the virtues of the past. Uh, this type of situation does bestow upon us the greatest and the last of the great prophets. The, the, the one who is honored now and recognized throughout the world by more than three billion human beings. Here is then a leadership more powerful than any in the past, a power of tremendous importance to the survival of mankind. And yet, in some mysterious way, this force is comparatively impotent. 
this force cannot decide whether we will use, a new, use nuclear weapons or not. It does not decide and cannot decide what constitutes the difference between the levels of crime. It has no clear way of explaining away the mystery of poverty. It has not the ability to create an enduring civilization. It can preach it, it can teach it, it can emphasize its importance, it can attribute it, the ideals to its founder, and do everything possible. But the world goes along very largely unconditioned. And even those who are nominally part of a faith seemingly have not the courage or the strength or the wisdom to defend it. Therefore we come now from the prophets of old to the prophet system of the modern world. We find that the same sounding word has two very definite definitions. To the one, the prophet is a symbol of a principle, the principle of, ident of identity with good. The other meaning of the word prophet has to do with an inducement, with a kind of compromise which has existed from the beginning. There are certain principles that we will pass over lightly because they are too expensive. We will also pass over them lightly because they interfere with the fulfillment of our own personal ambitions. Wherever a law or a rule inhibits the freedom of the individual to make his own mistakes, there's trouble. And this is one of the problems. We have now a civilization gradually developing which has no respect for law because the law itself has been so befuddled, has been so compromised, and has been so diluted uh, by personal ambitions and political structures that the average individual no longer respects it. So the one, the one controlling factor of antiquity was the will of God. The great controlling factor in our modern way of life is more or less the ticker tape on Wall Street. The uh, Wall Street ticker tape is now the great revealer of things. I remember as a boy, when I first went to work, that there were little restaurants in lower Manhattan where business people went in for touch of lunch uh, between sessions. On almost every table was a ticker tape machine. And while you chewed your sandwich, you looked over to see whether you were still in business. <laughs> now, also, the ancients never were very much given uh, to the ambitions which affect the average person. Uh, from, from the dawn of time, public, the, the public has had to endure uh, the corruptions of a few rich and powerful leaders. But today, the public sees itself now as all composed of rich and compromising leaders. Each one sees himself as the product of an economic system in which wealth is likely or possible. Now, in the last 20 or 25 years, we've been having a bad time with our economic system. We find that it's gradually getting completely out of hand. Well, way back in the time of Croesus, uh, the ancient Greek or uh, Cretan lord, who had his own private treasuries, he took a philosopher one day to show him all the treasures that he had stored away of gold and jewels and beautiful works of art and so forth. And the philosopher said to him, You have all the gold. But the first man who has better iron will take it all away from you. Now, we ought to realize this, but we don't. That was an old prophet, and his prophecy is applicable to now. And all those who believe uh, that we are going to be able to continue to expand selfishness until each individual has it all is very unreasonable and is subject to inevitable disappointment. There is no way in which we can take care of the moment without some reference to the wisdom of the past. The um, moment is too clouded. Things at the moment are so confused that no one really believes there is an answer. 
But if we go back a ways, we will find there always was an answer and always will be, but unfortunately we don't like it. We, it isn't the answer we want. We are concerned primarily with only one thing, the gratification of our own desires. Personal ambition has taken the place of veneration for deity. The individual's personal program of life is going contrary to the laws of living established from the beginning of time. Everything that we are doing today is short-sighted, but we live in a world that has a long future, whether we like it or not. We may try to destroy it, but we will never destroy the great plan, because it will go on. And it is certain that a power great enough to develop and to perfect this universal structure is not going to be outwitted by one little individual who he created, or was created by deity, who wants to do it badly. It is uh, the story again of the fall of man, and is found in uh, St. Augustine's uh, book on the city of God, in which there are two very definite structures, which the ancients recognized, and we recognize, I guess, but we make a different emphasis. According to St. Augustine, the two great cities of the world are the city of God and the city of Babylon. Now, he pointed out, borrowing very largely from Plato, that the city of Babylon was the material confusion of self-centered people, that this Babel or Babylon was the monument to selfishness and arrogance and corruption. And the city of God was the heavenly world, ruled over by the divine power. Now, in our way of life today, we are living in this double situation. The city of God is still here, but we can't see it. The city of Babylon is here for a time, and we see it every minute. As a result of this constant emphasis upon the corruption of the time, we find day by day our moral system is being lowered. Little by little we are removing the Ten Commandments. We are also destroying the statute of common friendship. We are endangering our health. We are becoming psychoneurotics and narcotic addicts. And the whole world is locked in confusion and discord among the parts of itself. Now this cannot be regarded as a success. Nor can we cover it all with the great, big, beautiful term, progress. Uh, the progress is here. And incidentally, if we want to follow it deeply enough into Aristotle or some of the Egyptian mystics, what we are in now is progress. Real progress. Because it's so bad we can't keep at it. Progress is therefore going to be through a great disillusionment followed perhaps by the most uh, difficult times physically that humanity has had in the last 10,000 years. Progress, then, must come in with repentance. It must become man waking up to the realization of his mistake and changing himself. And this is the last thing he wants to do. He wishes to continue to do it well only if it pleases him. He will accept very little of the Ten Commandments today. He is consistently breaking all of them. He is doing it, however, because it is expedient. Also, he is probably reaching a point where he doubts very seriously whether these Ten Commandments mean anything. But he has failed to look around him. Every commandment that he breaks leaves a monument of tragedy behind it. Every bit of selfishness that we exercise adds to our own pain. And for a few hours or a few days of comfort, we sacrifice a lifetime of integrity. So day by day, we are realizing, more than perhaps any other generation, that we stand in the face of a change that must be accomplished. Now, many people probably will never try to accomplish it. Perhaps the death rate will take care of some of them. But we are also unhappy over the fact that young people growing up have not had greater opportunity 
to discover the values of life. We are now locked again in the same old struggle as to whether religion should be taught in the public schools. I think if we think of religion as a conflict of creeds, it should not be taught in the public school. We cannot teach sectarianism because it's not the materialist who is going to prevent it, but the sectarians themselves. They are not going to cooperate or permit anything to be taught that is at variance with their own particular sect, whatever it may be. Therefore, rather than take a chance of losing dominance for their own group, they are willing to sacrifice the religious training for all the others. Now, this is a mistake, of course, but it arises primarily from the fact that we have a very poor definition of religion. If we want to consider religion as divided into packages, and these are neatly arranged on racks, it is possible to realize that we might fear that somebody will open the wrong package. But if we believe in religion as it was believed in antiquity, as the manifestation of man's respect for the divine plan of which he is a part, there is no reason why certain religious instruction is not possible in our educational system. It is a matter of transcending sectarianism and getting down to the basic needs of life. Now, we may also point out that uh, it is quite possible to discuss religion and teach it on a philosophical, historical basis. It is not necessary to go into the crash of creeds. It is not necessary to become involved in all the squabbles of the ages. All that is really necessary is to recognize that there is a universal integrity, that this can be demonstrated from history and from experience, and that the individual is entitled to know something about that part of human culture which has dominated and directed it constructively since the dawn of time. There's no more reason why the great religious philosophies of the world should be ignored than that we should take the banking system out of education. These are, Education is to know what our world is why it functions the way it does, and how we can do something about it if it functions badly. And every child is entitled to this instruction from the beginning of his educational life. Instead of that, we are so afraid that education might be idealistic and interfere with the economic advancement of a few groups that we take this long chance, which is very, very wrong. Now, if we are interested to find out the prophets of, all, of our time, what it's all about, all you do have to do is to listen to the reports of the various investment councils and to learn the uh, opinions of ex outstanding economists. And the economists today has taken the place of the Isaiahs of yesterday. Today it is the economist who solemnly pronounces what's going to happen to Bethlehem Steel or to uh, Chrysler Motors. These are important discoveries. What is happening to the human being in these patterns is ne neatly ignored. Everything and every emphasis is upon the protection of an economic system at all cost. Well, it should be protected. We all need it. But how are you going to protect an economic system if you don't do something to make people honest? How are we going to have an honest economy in the hands of dishonest persons? How are we going to solve any problem resolve involving the survival of any constructive institution if we do not find the causes that are undermining it and destroying it through selfishness, arrogance, and ambition? So we have the uh, very definite problem of trying to decide where our values lie. The average person today is probably willing to kind of make a certain compromise. He would like to have religious in instruction. He might very definitely send his children to, to Sunday school. He may go to church himself. He would like to have the experience of feeling good inside himself. He would like to have the happy fact that he is inwardly secure. But the uh, result of this situation is very difficult for him. 
Back in the days when the principles of things were laid down, it was pointed out definitely that only the individual who carries the responsibility of his own place in the plan can be a good citizen. Any individual who puts his own advantage above the common good is a bad citizen. And yet on that basis, we have too many bad citizens who think they are good citizens. We think we're a good citizen if we maybe help a few people in trouble. We think we're a good citizen if we try to vote without having very much knowledge about any of the candidates. We feel we are good citizens if we pay our taxes even though we resent them. All of these are great expressions of integrity, but the integrity lies much deeper than that. Our integrity comes from the one great pattern which we must restore, namely that the great text of our lives, the great system by which we must all live, is indicated in the great operations of universal law. Laws of human beings must be a part of a universal law that is greater. When human law conflicts with divine law, human law is ultimately going to lose. Therefore, we must try to find out what is necessary to our survival and then do it. This sounds very easy, but in truth it is very difficult. It is very difficult because of the tremendous confusion of ulterior motives. We are not really in a position to strike out clearly and honestly to the support of our various beliefs. So we now try to transfer the leadership of life from the obedience to natural law to the development of a successful, enduring economic system. We want to have an economy that will go on and on. We want to have a financial estate in nature and in space that will protect the futures of ourselves and our children and their children. We want to go on in a world in which everyone has an opportunity to be an individual and have constructive attitudes. We have all these thoughts definitely in our minds. We believe in them. We want them to happen. But we are not working in that direction very enthusiastically. We are not able to correct the basic fact, faults. Yet today there is a group arising that tells us that if the nuclear armament situation is not curbed, there may not be any world left for us to, to give on to our children. This, I think, is untrue. While I believe there is a grave danger in these things, I do not think that anything that man can create will destroy the world but it will destroy himself, and it will break down the, the structures which he has built at the expense of his own integrity. The dishonesties which have become monumental will be swept away by any cataclysm that forces us to redirect our energies in a constructive direction. So we have now to decide who is going to lead us, whether we want to depend upon the prophets of old, or put all our faith and hope in a bank book. We want to know whether in our own lives the end of life is to be achieved by improvement of character or by the size of the estate which we leave behind us. Well, of course, the problem of the estate is already under considerable stress, and uh, in the course of time our mistakes will probably result in bankruptcy for most people, because they will not be able to, contain, to maintain evil without tremendous extravagance. The only way the Romans could prevent the Huns and the Goths and the Visigoths from moving in on Rome was to bribe them to stay away. Now we are bribing an emergency to stay away from us by simply spending vast sums of money to build false barriers against confusion. It won't work. There's no solution lying in this direction. We will be bankrupt in the end, and the faults will still remain. The only answer is to get to work on the problem. If we had gone to one of the sibyls of old, or one of the prophets, and stood before him 
as Solomon stood before the prophet of Israel, he would tell us very simply what the matter is. He would say that our worries, fears, and the evidences that hurt us, disturb us today, are simply handwriting on the wall of heaven. We are being weighed in the balance, and we are definitely being found wanting. That's the trouble, wanting too much. (laughs) We have sacrificed the values which should have made us a great people. Now, we're still here, and therefore there's always time for improvement. The individual has a certain span here, and nature in its curious wisdom has built the length of the human life as a final proof of the fallacy of physical ambition. But the individual says, as Mussolini is reported to have said, that he would rather live a few years as a lion than a long life as a lamb. Well, he got his wish. (laughs) And along with him, Hitler got his the same treatment. Always the tyrant, the dictator, the selfish individual, even though he may do some good, and could have been a great value to his people, became ambitious, overly ambitious, and feeling himself to be a person of destiny, uh, took took upon himself the destruction of his world. Now, we have these two problems, then, that we have to face, namely, that we are either going to be uh, able to restore the city of God in our world, or else we're going to have a very hard winter with the city of Babylon. And the Babylon means confusion. And if you can think of anything more confusing than 1983, it's a very, very difficult thing to think about. There is practically nothing that is not tied up in knots. And all these knots are man-made. And everyone is fighting desperately to make certain that no one unties the knots because to do so is to damage somebody's ambitions and somebody's uh, glory and reputation. So we have the problem always, as we've had it uh, in the past, that something has to gradually happen. We are getting to the point now where it better happen. And uh, we are not in a political position to do too much about it, But we can accomplish a great deal in other ways. One thing we can try very hard to do now is to make our own personal lives constructive. That we can definitely, even at a certain expense to our own pocketbooks, decide to try and be straight and honest. That we will not take unfair advantage. That we will not overcharge and overprice that we will not shoddy our goods. And if by any chance we happen to own an apartment house, we're not going to double the rentals just because other people do. We're going to try to be fair about things. We are not going to consider the importance of luxury as more valuable than integrity. The strange problem that we see today is that the average person around us and the religious person is in a disaster in a disaster and a dilemma wish we could get back again to the days when the great temples shadowed the, the walks of Athens or Alexandria we have no great leading spiritual institution that works that has greater power than political policy and is free from all selfishness and self-centered arrogance. We do not have a place of security where the young can go for enlightenment and receive the truth. We are unable to find the institution which, as older people, we can know is dependable and which will survive us and protect the future for our children and their children. There is no center of integrities that is stronger than human selfishness. This being the case, something has to be done about it. And the way that it has to be done is, as always in these matters, is finally to realize that the voice of the people is the voice of God. When enough persons wake up to the facts of life, 
These facts will lead us to the changes that are necessary. In the meantime, in, in additional integrities of our own, the acceptance of responsibilities, which we are now trying to avoid, the recognition that we must share life with other people honestly and fairly, and that if it becomes necessary for us to decide between integrity and luxury, we will choose integrity. There is no need for the individual to cater to every appetite that he has. There is no need for him to be jealous of everyone who has more than himself. The problem of each person is to find integrity in himself, peace and security in his own heart and soul. And if society cannot provide it for him, then he must provide it for himself. This perhaps is the principle as mentioned or thought of in the works of Plato. Uh, Plato sort of comes to the conclusion that man is no longer uh, attended by a series of celestial babysitters. He is no longer being guarded, guided, and chastised on the moment that he makes a break or makes a mistake. He is not going to be completely cuddled and cuddled by a divine power that will do his thinking for him and will protect him in all of the affairs of life regardless of how he lives and at the end of his life will take him virtuous or sin-ridden into his arms and forgive him all things. This type of thinking is no longer conceivable as part of a way of life. We are here in this dilemma, perhaps because of our uh, individualistic potential. We are here because it is now possible for the human being uh, to correct himself. It is no longer necessary for him to make the mistakes of his ancestors because he can see what is happening. In the last ten years, he has seen most of the mistakes uh, which he still continues to make come to grief. He able to see a world that is burdened by the fact that everybody is thinking only of themselves. And also that in addition to the major problems, there are all kinds of little problems which are gravitating against integrity. The weakening of home structure, for example, is contributing to the delinquency of the young. And the only answer to that problem is that you cannot be a delinquent family and then punish a child into morality. The child who has proper in home life will be the one who has the courage to do things better. But it not only takes dedication, affection, and kindness, but thoughtfulness and integrities upon the part of the parents. All these things have to be done. Now we say, well, maybe we can't live to see it done. We won't be here that long. Well, nature has provided us with another factor that is very important, and which seems to me to be one of the essences of the whole situation, and that is the doctrine of re a rebirth, reincarnation. Reincarnation is a law of nature, and it exists for one simple reason, that no individual can become perfect in one life. It is impossible for the individual to move from a relative state of ignorance to an absolute state of wisdom in the course of 60, 70, or 80 years. It may be that in the past he has come part of the way, and therefore will make a longer step now. But it also is inevitable that we must extend all processes of growth and unfoldment into the future. Uh, we, If we want to uh, have this life that is better, if we want to build gradually for the perfection that is possible to mankind, we have to develop a long-range philosophy. We have to say, I will do the best I can today. I will make as little bad karma as possible now. And when faced with problems, I will try to solve them now. I will not avoid them or evade them in the hope that they will disappear. All the way along, we will try to be honest today, straight today, and follow today the rules and laws that have been given to us by the wise of all ages. If we succeed in doing this, we will probably drop out of embodiment uh, without having achieved everything, maybe just one little step we have made that will be permanent. But we are citizens of eternity, 
and the wisdom or gain and spiritual integrities which we make now become part of a great background of faith and truth which we carry into the future. If we become better today, the world is better tomorrow. If we are able to go out of this life uh, with a higher standard of integrity than we came into it, then the next generation or the next time we return, that we will help to build a better world than the one we have now. The great problem of all of this, of course, has always been the same, namely the domination of the imminent over the eminent. We have been so desperately desirous of having all that we want now that we are content to become materialistic in a universe where materialism does not actually exist and that no amount of atheism or intellectualism can destroy one fragment of the great integrities of life. So we have on one hand a code that has come down to us from the past, perpetuated by some of the world's noblest thinkers. And we have on the other hand a concept that has developed among ourselves, perhaps beginning under a buttonwood tree in lower Manhattan, that everything ultimately depends upon a vast industrialization of humanity. That the important thing here and now is progress. And that progress is going to be measured in larger computers, but there's nothing really to do with the individual except the discipline of learning to run a computer. Little by little, we are going to lose more and more of our humanity. We are going to depend completely upon devices which ultimately will magnify our unemployment beyond all reasonable bounds. Every contribution of science today to industrial development means less people working. We are now planning to take mankind away from the lath, away from the uh, assembly line and all these things. We are going to also do the problem of trying to uh, curb in some way an over-labor market, but which cannot be controlled by any of the methods we're using at the present time. Unless the individual wishes to make a grand program of birth control, we are going to continue to increase. We're going to have more and more people. The more people we have, the more we have to share and the more we have to live together. And if we have enough people and we have to share with enough of them and live together without destroying them, we may almost fulfill some of the better predictions of Isaiah. That there are solutions. There are solutions. This earth can, can take on upon itself many more people than are on it today. Many more. If these people are honest, sincere, and dedicated to the common advancement of mankind. But we're going to have one desperation after another if each citizen thinks only of making an additional profit off of the losses to his neighbor. So we have this type of profit now, and we have predictions on it. We have a profit about how we're going to cut down overhead, how we're going to create better mass production, how we're going to sell machinery to undeveloped countries in order that they can go and become developed and compete with us. We are going to arm the world and uh, feel perfectly happy about the, uh, the employment that armament construction involves. It's a job for most people. All these things are part of um, economic materialism, based upon scientific materialism to a large degree, supported by economic and educational uh, materialism, which is intended primarily to support and fulfill the labor needs of material institutions in science and industry. In other words, we want to pre make, create more and more people who will advance the projects of material progress and will continue to struggle and fight and labor and die as they have for ages. This type of prophecy, this prophecy that we can beat the economic situation, that great prosperity lies around the corner, is simply foolish. It does not lie beyond around the corner. The individual 
must create the situation that is necessary or it will never come. He must realize that nature intends mankind to be one large, happy family, and that all effort to grow and improve by taking it away from somebody else is ultimately a mistake. So the great uh, chambers and books and columns and com commentators that we hear every day are the new prophets. They are the ones who tell us about this or about that. For the most part, however, they are rather pessimistic at the moment. But the prophets of Israel were pessimistic most of the time because there was always the conflict between the truth and the ambitions of princes. Today is the difference between the truth and the economical ambitions of individuals to whom wealth is the final answer to everything. Yet with all that, how this can be with the person facing life as he must is unbelievable. There is something that is a trace of congenital moronity that's in here somewhere. <laughs> uh, how a person can be happy and satisfied to build a fortune and then die of a stroke in the midst of it. It's just hard to understand. It is not scientific. It is not economic. It, and uh, the idea of this vast wealth being distributed among a group of spoiled children is no more intelligent. And the possibility of dedicating this wealth to institutions who are the, which are the cause of the trouble doesn't get us far either. We leave a vast fortune to some institution to build a, a larger uh, nuclear unit is, is no better than imbecility. So in all these things, we are simply foolish. How can we claim to be grown up mature people with some sense of values, some intelligence presumably functioning in us, and make such stupid decisions to look at everything in the face and see nothing to be in the presence of a world that needs the best of us and we keep on giving them the worst so we have conferences we have leagues we have all kinds of institution to peace to create peace and the what happens the delegates tell us very frankly that they are in a position where they must defend the political structures of their own countries, and these structures are con in conflict with other countries and more in conflict with common sense. So nothing gets accomplished. We need to get down to the realization of the Pythagorean unification of knowledge. We have to bring things that are valuable together so they will not war with each other. What we need is a realization of one world religion that is free from, it, from theological absurdities, but based upon a philosophical, spiritual contemplation of the actual operation of universal law. Universal law, as we call it, is divine law. And only that law which is actual and eternal and unchangeable by man is important. In a scientific institution, we have a constant investigation of the various manifestations of universal life. We know, for instance, beyond any question of doubt, how the human body functions. We also know that whatever brought this function into a pattern and gave it domination and made it possible for us to use it has a wisdom beyond comprehension by us. We are not even able to understand one cell in this structure, where it came from or why it's there. We have no idea what the various parts of our own bodies believe, think, or know. We assume they believe, think, or know nothing. And this may be a grave error, because every once in a while we make some of these little bodies mad and they can make us awful sick. We have got to keep rules. And it is the duty of science to find the rules that are necessary for the greater good of the greater number and to teach and actually practice these rules. 
It is the duty of religion to unite in creating hope, in strengthening faith, and giving the individual the internal value power, the strength, to enable him to live a good life. And it is the proper job of economics and the material side of things to provide the individual with the means of his own maintenance of health and shelter and food and protection that he needs. That it should be part of the material world to make sure that the individual's physical life is as healthy as possible. It is not the purpose of any of these to get rich off of its own kind or of any other kind. We are not supposed to be here to provide shelter on the basis of how much each house pays the contractor. As long as this is done, there will be the homeless. As long as personal physical gain is placed above material between moral and ethical progress, whereas we have in trouble now, we'll be more so, because we are still working against the divine plan, and no one who works against it will succeed. It's about time to wake up, not only here, but everywhere. India, China, Russia, Korea, all the countries of Europe and Latin America, after all, are made up of human beings striving to live trying to survive the corruptions of their leaderships, the ignorance in themselves, and the lack of faith in each other. This type of thing is basic. It is far more basic than any of the specialized fields of learning that we are now maintaining so carefully. We all have a right to know enough to take care of ourselves constructively and also, in that knowledge, receive the instruction by which it becomes possible to take care of ourselves without injuring anyone else. Until we get these type of things, our prophecies are going to be very poor. So the modern prophets tell us how much we can put in the bank, they tell us how much we can make by investment, and all this type of thing. And within reason, and within the proper proprieties of life, organization of physical resources and physical problems is necessary. On the other hand, all of the use of that which we have, all of the, of the goal of our lives, should be above the material level that we know. We may have to have certain material assets in order to function, but our function should be to rise above these assets and use the privileges that have been given to us for the advancement of society. Those who have more should do more for the common good. If they can think this way and build this way, we can get some other points of view across to people. So we have to now listen to the ticket tape for our guidance or else listen to the sages of the past. We can either build upon a material situation that is falling apart more rapidly than we can control it, or go back again to the basic principles upon which mankind has functioned, principles which have, per, per, have been perpetuated through the ages, but with some distortions, and these distortions must be corrected. We must not mistake religion and theology. They are not the same thing. We must not uh, confuse the purposes of science, for well, the purpose, final purpose of science is not to advance knowledge, but to improve life. And that improvement of life means that the scientist must be a priest as well as a scholar. He must be dedicated to the improvement of humanity and not to the advancement of an economic or industrial monopoly. All of these uh, errors have to be corrected basically. Now, we can start and do it as soon as we become aware of this fact. We can do it pretty soon. We can all work at it a little every day. If we go work at it a little every day, we will go out of this life with a better hope, because we will have a better understanding of the life we're living now. And furthermore, we will realize 
that the what we have stored up in the form of grace within ourselves, what we have learned to experience, the love we have grown to appreciate and value, and the honesty which has become a part of our own constitution, all these values go on. And in the future of things, the world we are going to live in is going to be the result of what we do now to improve the present state of mankind. It is a very important time in our lives. It is a time in which we must select our leaderships, whether we are going to be led by the truths of the ages or led by the ambitions of selfish people today. We cannot necessarily change them, but we can understand the facts and keep our own characters as clean as possible and build as much to the much that we can possibly build a better daily existence. We can get over our animosities and our prejudices. We can get over our jealousies and our conceits. We can gradually learn to admire and respect other people. We can get over all of these little things which nag and persecute us from the time we are born. And little by little, there will emerge from this struggle what might be termed the human being. The human being is in the making, but he is not perfected yet. And at the moment, he does not seem he's going to he's going to rush into perfection in the near future. <laughs> what he's going to have to do in the near future and now is to recognize that he grows a little by degrees, that every good thought adds to what he is, and whatever and every poor thought delays his own development. So little by little, getting to understand himself and his world and going back to the old prophets and moderating his present prophet system, he is apt to come along a little better than he has in the past. And with those kind words, I think our time is up.